Well, good afternoon. I trust you've had a good day in the Lord and that you're uh, excited about being together with other people in worship and that uh, we'll have some fun here tonight uh, in God's house. I am just so delighted that you've made the choice to be with us. And I know there are those who are uh, with us uh, by way of the internet who uh, are not able to be with us, but certainly we need to be thinking about them in, this, in these days and praying for them when the Lord prompts us to do those kinds of things. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you know that verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, God says, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And so within that context, we recognize that uh, 2 Chronicles 7 is dealing with um, the dedication of Solomon's temple, and that in that context, um, this prayer was proclaimed, and, and God declares to the children of Israel, recognizing that they are God's people in the same sense that we are God's people in this day, and that he's called us to humble ourselves and pray. And one of the reasons for us coming together on Wednesday evening is that we might pray together, intercede on behalf of those who have needs round about us, and take them into the very presence of God. Because you remember that the Bible tells us that part of our inheritance in Christ is that we have access, direct access, into the very presence of Almighty God. Not based upon anything we've done, but based solely and completely on that which Christ did for us. So we recognize that we have an opportunity in the midst of our time of prayer to take people into the very throne room of God, and the Word of God, the book of Hebrews tells us, that there in God's presence people can find help in time of need. And so we're able to uh, assist, we're able to, uh, to do a work within the context of our praying, and that God is then glorified when we do what he's called us to do. So we are his people, we're called by his name, we're Christians, and um, we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are mathetes, which is the Greek word for disciples. And so as such, we have an obligation and a responsibility to pray for the needs of people round about us. And to pray, the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul declares to us in the book of Romans, that we are required to pray for our leaders and not only those in national office, but those in state offices and local offices as well. And that it is our obligation as the people of God to do that kind of thing. And that people round about us ought to, ought to be able to count on us. They ought to be able to trust us enough that when we say we're going to pray for them, we pray for them. And that we actually take them into the very presence of God. Because there is where God abides and that's where people receive what they need in these days. So I wonder this afternoon if there are those on your hearts tonight 
that we might be praying for, uh, not only this evening, but uh, as we move forward in faith as the people of God here at Freedom Church. Who's on your heart tonight? Yes, sir. Sure, certainly. Okay. Thank, thank you, Marty. Appreciate that. We'll certainly pray for Joanne's daughter, Lisa Bridgewater, and for Miss Dot as well. Uh, as we go to the throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords this evening. Something else on your heart this afternoon. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll certainly be praying that way that uh, you are able to go in July to Cuba. And, uh, amen. <laughs> That's a good first step. <laughs> amen. Very good. Thank you, Brother Larry. And certainly we need to remember those churches there. Um, we're in a position uh, uh, through Great Commission Ministries to begin to... Uh, uh, send money that way, and um, they're in dire need, and uh, we certainly need to be thinking about uh, low those many pastors and low those many churches and those uh, members of those churches there that uh, don't have the kinds of things that we have here, and that the Bible declares to us that he who has been given much, much will be required, and that because we're here. <laughs> In, in a Western country, and we have lots of things that we're going to have to give an account of what we do as stewards of the manifold graces of God. And so we need to not only be praying for them, but be but sending to them as well. And uh, that's going to begin tomorrow morning. So uh, you pray for that, that it goes well, and that we're able to continue to do that as the Lord would allow, and um, that the government would allow that as well within that context. Thank you, Brother Larry. Appreciate that. Any specific churches we need to be praying for this this evening? All of them. All of them. Amen. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Something else or someone else tonight on your heart? I know I say this just about every time I stand up here and we talk about praying, but we need to be remembering each other in our prayers and... Um, that um, we recognize that uh, all of us have needs and that uh, many of them no one knows but us and God. But uh, when God brings people to our minds, we need to be lifting them up in prayer because we don't know the exact situation that they find themselves in, but we do know that we can pray for them. There are lots of things we can't do, but we most certainly can do that. And God can be glorified through our prayers. Someone else. Amen. Thank you, Marty. Social unrest. Something else. I don't know about you, but every time I come into the parking lot here, I am, I am so very pleased, and I recognize how blessed we are to have a facility like this. I mean, it's just a blessing from God. 
that we're able to meet in a place like this and worship. Because lots of people don't have that kind of opportunity. And we need to never take that for granted, what God has done through people to bring us to this place. Something else on your heart tonight. Or someone else on your heart tonight. Let's pray together as the family of God here in this place. Heavenly Father, tonight we honor you with our lives. We recognize that you have called out Freedom Church to be a change agent, not only in Taylor County, but in Campbellsville and in Central Kentucky and in our world as well. And Father, we recognize that in the context of being called as a change agent, that you have a perfect will for this body. Father, I pray that whatever impediments might be in our way that might keep us from doing your perfect will, that we would so find ourselves consumed with your will that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that which you've called us to do both individually and corporately, and that we operate according to your will in all that we do, top to bottom, side to side, everything that Freedom Church does, Father, I pray that it would be done within the context of your perfect will, and that we would subordinate ourselves unto you, that we would recognize that you are king, you are the covenant God who loves us. And because you have placed your love on us and in us, that we now have an obligation to love others as well. And so tonight, Father, we would pray for those believers in Cuba tonight. Father, we recognize that they have limited food supplies and that even as it has become more difficult for us to get food um, because of this pandemic, it is nothing in comparison to what they are experiencing in Cuba in these days. And so we would pray especially for them this afternoon. We would pray that all those members of churches there in that country might have a renewed sense of your presence in their lives and that they would recognize that you're watching over them and that you are protecting them and that you desire to see them prosper spiritually in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, tonight we thank you for Brother Larry and we would ask that as uh, he is already obtained tickets for July, that you would work out all the details and that that trip might become a reality and that whatever things might seek to impede that travel, that you would tamp them down and that that might be something that genuinely takes place here in the next couple of months. And so we pray for those pastors and those church leaders there in that place as well. That we would pray that they would be filled with your spirit. We pray that you would give them unction to do that work that they've been called to do. And we pray that you would give them uh, the presence of your Holy Spirit in the preparation of messages and teachings and all of those things that they do to interact relationally with the people there in Cuba. And so, Father, tonight, we recognize that uh, there are members of our family who have needs. We pray especially tonight for Miss Joanne because I know that she is so concerned about Lisa. And so we pray that you would give her the peace that passes all understanding. And that uh, as Lisa has to go to the doctor over the course of the next few days, we pray that she would get a good report 
we pray that uh, you would guide the doctors and the nurses as they minister unto her. Pray that you would give her strength in these days to do what needs to be done and that you would be glorified through her life and through this situation she finds herself in. Father, we would pray tonight for Miss Dot. We ask your blessing on her. We thank you for her. We pray that uh, as she goes forward in faith, that you would restore her unto health and that you might bring her back to us in the next few days. Thank you for her. Father, for those of our number who are hearing this broadcast tonight, I would pray for them individually, recognizing that they are your children, recognizing that you love them, recognizing that they need a touch from you in the midst of these days. And so we would pray for the power of your Holy Spirit in their lives tonight and that you as the great revealing God might reveal yourself to them in a most outstanding way and that you would be glorified through their lives. Father, for every person in this room tonight, I speak peace on them. I pray that your will would be done in their lives. I pray that they might uh, have a fresh sense of your presence. And through the fresh sense of your presence, they might do your perfect will. And so we ask your blessing upon our time here together tonight. Watch over us and protect us. Keep us safe from any harm. Remind us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through you to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of imaginations, and every high and lofty thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of you. And so we recognize that we have been divinely empowered to do ministry. And so we pray tonight as we look at the third psalm that you would enlighten us in the power of your Spirit and that through our time here together tonight we might gain knowledge and insight into your very Word and we might go away from this room saying it's been good to be in God's house and it's been good to be with God's people. Watch over us with your overwhelming care and love. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Tonight, we're going to look at Psalm 3. So if you have a copy of God's Word, let me direct your attention to Psalm 3. Now within the context of Psalm 3, both Psalm 3 and 4, if you look at them together, you will discover that they are closely related in structure, in circumstance, and in time. Notice also at the beginning of Psalm 3 that the Word of God declares to us, and I'm going to read to you what it says in the New King James Version of Scripture, that you would recognize that it tells us not only a title, but it gives us a, a tinge, a bit of background information about this particular psalm. Notice that Psalm 3 is entitled, The Lord Helps His Troubled People. And then it says, A Psalm of David, When He Fled from Absalom His Son. Now, originally, these psalms did not have titles, nor did they have these explanatory um, pieces of material with them. But when the Septuagint was put together, when the translation called the Septuagint was done, and that was done in the... 3rd century B.C., about 245 B.C. or so, that it was the Septuagint 
that laid down not only these titles, but gave us this explanatory information that we have within the context of these psalms. So you would recognize that um, the 3rd century B.C. would be post-exilic Judaism, correct? And would be after Malachi was written as well, because Malachi was the last book in the Old Testament. And so we would discover then that there was a 400-year period of time where God did not speak publicly. And so when we get to the Synoptic Gospels, we would understand that God spoke first of all to Zechariah and Elizabeth about John the Baptist, and then to Mary and Joseph about Jesus. So we we see the putting together, the translation of the Septuagint as being post-exilic. So the Septuagint, and the word Septuagint just literally means 70, because there were 70 scholars who were involved in the process of putting the, the Old Testament that was originally written in Hebrew into Greek. And so we discover then that in the context of the Septuagint, that they put these notes within the context of the Psalms. And so if you and I are going to understand Psalm 3, there are a couple of things that we need to understand. This psalm was used by the Jews as a mourning, not not mourning as in someone uh, dealing, lamenting death, but mourning as in early in the day that this was a morning psalm, a morning song, if you will. And that um, Psalm 4 was an evening psalm. And so we discover here that both of these tell us about God's faithfulness to His anointed one, when the kingdom was oppressed. And so what we see in Psalm 3, we see mirrored in some, to some extent in Psalm 4 as well. But what we discover is that Absalom, the son of David, tried to create a coup that would destroy King David's monarchy. And so we discover in 2 Samuel, beginning in chapter 15, running through chapter 18, those truths related to the coup attempt by David's son, Absalom. And what I'd like to do tonight is to go to 2 Samuel, and I've I've pulled some verses out that I want to share with you to help you understand the backstory, if you will, of the third psalm. Because there's some things that you and I need to see in 2 Samuel that will help us understand what's being said as well within the context of the third psalm. So, in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25, and I know that is pre-coup material, I I want you to see what the Word of God says to us about Absalom. So in verse 25 of chapter 14 in 2 Samuel, this is what the Word of God says. Now in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So the word of God is declaring to us that um, Absalom looked really good. And that he had no blemishes on his body at all. 
and that some of those things would have been said about David before his marriage, years and years before this. Second thing I want you to see is found in chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. And what we see here is that Absalom is beginning the process of getting the children of Israel on his side to be king in opposition to his dad, who is currently the king. <coughs> Excuse me. So I begin to read to you in verse 4 of chapter 15. Oh, that I were made, and moreover Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who had any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. So what we're seeing here is that Absalom was questioning the justice of King David and that he was functioning in a position whereby when people were seeking to bring their cases to King David, that Absalom would meet them before they had an opportunity to go into the justice chamber with the king, King David, and that Absalom would talk to them, and Absalom would try to sway them into believing that he would make a better king than his dad, and that he would do a better job of justice than his dad would do. So look what it says, verse 5. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. And then look at what the word of God says. So Absalom stole the hearts of of the men of Israel. And so because they liked what they heard, because he was saying things that they wanted to hear, because he was good looking, because he was the king's son, that they begin, all of the men of Israel begin to like Absalom more than they like King David. Verse 7 says, Now it came to pass after 40 years. So for 40 years, Absalom was doing this kind of thing. So this was an everyday occurrence for a period of 40 years that Absalom was trying to put together a coup against his dad. And it came to pass 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. Now, if we read through this passage, what we would discover is that Absalom lied to his dad, that he had no desire at all to go to Hebron to pay a vow that he'd made to Almighty God. So we discover here that um, he sent for people who were under him and people who were listening to him so that he might be in a position now, after a period of 40 years, to be raising up an army that would be in opposition to King David. And so at the end of this passage, we, we see in chapter 15, verse 12, the end of verse 12, and the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. And so within the context of what David says to us over in the third psalm, we discover that the people that were coming against David were increasing in number. And that this passage says to us that as 
Absalom was having his servants under him gather the people together so that they could go after David, that they had an army as large as 12,000 people that were looking for King David so that they could kill him and then put Absalom on the throne. So in, um, in verse 13, we find this message to David from one of his followers who knew the situation there in Israel. And look what it says. Now a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So in essence, what happened was that Absalom sought to steal the kingdom from his dad and that he so enticed the men of Israel that they begin to listen to Absalom instead of listening to King David. So go with me to chapter 17. Now Thinephel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak, and make him afraid. And all of the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. Then I will bring back all the people to you, when all return except the man whom you seek. All the people will be at peace, and the saying pleased Absalom and all the who? All the elders of Israel. So not only had David lost the people, he had lost the elders of Israel as well. And so in essence what had taken place is that, that David had a very small group of people who were still loyal to him, but the majority of people had shown their allegiance to Absalom. And then you'll remember from your Sunday school days that Absalom had this great long hair. And that the Bible tells us that um, in the woods of Ephraim, one of the twelve tribes, that in the woods of Ephraim there was a great battle. And that as Absalom was riding on this mule, that he came under a tree and his hair got stuck in the tree. And Joab, who was one of David's followers, now you need to understand the situation here. David said, do not kill my son Absalom. Do not kill him. Because no matter what you think about him, as it relates to me, he is still my son. And so Absalom was hanging in a tree. And Joab found out about that, got three spears, and ran those three spears through Absalom's heart and killed him. And David grieved and wept bitterly over the death of his son. So let me read part of that passage to you. And in chapter 18, beginning in verse 14, Then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart, while he was yet still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And the ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel. And Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar after his own day, and to this day it is called Absalom's Monument. 
So the one that they were going to install as king, Absalom, was killed by one of David's men, and David was still king. So that brings us then to Psalm 3. And so as I read this to you, I have a couple of questions I want to share with you of things I want you to look for within the context of that which I read. Now, the, the, the psalm is broken down into four paragraphs of two verses each, eight verses in the entirety of the passage. And so I want you to look for the main point or points within each of these four sections. And then I I want you to see David's complaint in verse 1. And then what were the people saying about David in verse 2? And then in verse 3, I want you to see how David viewed God. In verse 4, we discover what David did and what God did in response. And in verse 5, I want you to see what David was able to do because God sustained him. And then in verse 7 and verse 8, I I want you to see what David prayed for within the context of this psalm. So let me read it to us, and then we'll talk about these things that I have just declared to you. Psalm 3, beginning in verse 1. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and wept and slept, excuse me. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set them against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you have struck all mine enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to you, to you, O Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Now, recognizing that um, these psalms were to be sung, most people believe that uh, the term selah that we see in this psalm three times is a notation of music. Most scholars believe that the word literally means to rest. And so for you and me, as we read this, we need to think about, in the context of that rest, Selah, what God has declared to us in the previous section. So as we would look at this psalm, we would recognize that verses 1 and 2 declared declared to us, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And so the psalmist is declaring to us that there is more than meets the eye 
within the context of what's being declared to us as we read these black letters and words on white pages. That God wants to reveal to us and make application of this word to us in the day and age in which we live. Recognizing that that David was king about 1000 B.C. And that the kingdoms divided at the end of the reign of Solomon about 931 B.C. So we discover then that over 3,000 years ago, David was dealing with a situation that he turned to God for help. And that within the context of your life and mine, we understand that so too we should turn to God in the midst of the situation in our world today that we find ourselves in. (coughs) And that we should so trust Him that we can say like David that salvation belongs to the Lord and that God's blessings, and it is in the singular here, but you remember we talked about Sunday, that the blessings of God in the Hebrew are not singular. The blessings of God are plural. That is to say that God just doesn't dispense one blessing to people, that there are a multiplicity of blessings that God wants to shower down on His people. And so we recognize that uh, this passage talks to us about David's distress. And so when you and I think of the distress we find ourselves in, although our distress may not be to the extent that David's was in the sense that he could lose his life through violence, that no matter what distress we find ourselves in, that God continues to be a very present help in time of trouble for you and for me. And that we look to Him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Now it's interesting to note that it says Lord, and that's in capital letters, you you understand that. We've talked about that time and time again. And that just reminds us that David is using the covenant name of God implying that he has a relationship with Almighty God. So he's using the name Yahweh or Jehovah here, that the Jews would not speak, and so within the context of the Old Testament, they use the term Lord in all capital letters to remind us and to imply for us that the author, David, had a relationship with Almighty God. And look what it says, Lord, how they have increased. And that the word increased here is an exclamation in the Hebrew. And so the emphasis of what David is saying is how these people have increased. And how that number continues to grow. And every time he hears from the spies who would know what Absalom was doing, he discovered that he had that many more people, that many more who were following after him and coming after David in these days. And so you notice in this passage as well that at the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2 that we find the term many, M-A-N-Y, And that word in Hebrew literally means distress. And it's talking about uh, Absalom's army coming against David. And just as I read to you over in 2 Samuel, they were looking to kill him. And it says, notice what it says in the second line of verse 1. Many are they who rise up against me. And rising up against him is a picture in that language of they're looking to kill him. So that they can place David's son Absalom on the throne. 
So think about how stealthy David had to be. Think about an army of 12,000 people looking for one individual. And that one individual had to hide day and night or risk being caught by Absalom and that Absalom would have killed him having had the opportunity so he could set himself up to be king. Then look at, look at verse 2. Many are they who say of me. Now who would that be? It would be the children of Israel. Because they've now thrown their allegiance on to Absalom. And they were speaking bad about King David. They were looking for another way rather than looking to him. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And yet, nothing in the midst of this distress dissuaded David from following after Almighty God and placing his faith and his trust in God. And he knew that God was going to take care of him. No matter what that meant, God was going to look out for him. So in verses 3 and 4, we recognize that he's talking about his trust in God. So look what it says. But you, O Lord, once again he uses the covenant name of God, once, but you, O Lord, are a shield to me. Recognizing that a shield was a covering in battle. And so David recognized that where he was in the midst of the distress that he was living in at this point in time, and that he was having to deal with things that he probably didn't want to have to deal with, this distress was never ending. And so he uses this picture of God as being his shield. And that God was protecting him in the midst of what was going on round about him. So look what David says about God in this section. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. So he says that uh, God is his shield. My glory. So God was David's glory. So think about that just for a moment. David is declaring when he says that God is his glory, not only is he in covenantal relationship with Almighty God, but that God is to receive David's glory no matter what the situation. And I guess what you and I could learn from this situation is that no matter where we find ourselves and what situation we find ourselves in, God should be our glory as well. That we look to Him as being one who receives the glory for our lives. Remember we talked about 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray that when we function in humility before God, that means we're giving up our own glory, correct? and that we're giving it over to God. So we see Solomon doing that at the dedication of his temple, and we see David doing that here in Psalm 3 as well. And so God was for David his shield. God was for David his glory. And then it says, notice what it says here, the one who lifts up my head. Now think about that. It would have been very easy for David to get down, wouldn't it? 
And so you, it would have been very easy for you to be able to tell by his body language that, that he's distressed, that, that, that's, that Absalom wants to kill him, that Absalom has this great army that's coming to get him. And yet what David says here is that Almighty God becomes the razor of his head that changes his body language, that changes his perspective, that reminds him that God's in charge and nothing's going to happen to David that God does not allow. And so even in the midst of this, you need to understand that when you go back and read David's life, what you discover is that David lived in in caves and slept on cold, not concrete, but rocks in the midst of those places. And here is Absalom assuming the position of the king in the house of the king. And David knew that Absalom had taken that place. And it would have been very easy for him to become depressed. Very easy for him to become disoriented in the the midst of his distress. And yet, what we see here is that As he went to God, God became the razor, the raising of his head. And then it says, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. So how would David know that God heard him? How do you know when God hears you? How do you deal with that? How do we know the voice of God? Well, first of all, we recognize that the voice of God is always going to be in accord with His holy word. It's never going to be contrary to His word. And so if you get, if you get a message in your, in your cranium that you think is from God, you need to check it out with the word to make sure that it aligns itself with the word. And so maybe David didn't have the same kind of word that you and I had. You know, so whatever portions of the Old Testament that he had, he knew the voice of God because he had encountered God on numerous occasions. And that he recognized that uh, God heard him and responded to him. And so... David's relationship with God was not a monologue. It wasn't just David speaking to God. But it was David having a conversation with God. And I don't know whether God talked to David with an audible voice. He certainly could do that if he chooses to. And I don't have any problem believing that God can still still speak that way because Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I don't have a problem believing that God speaks that way. But what I do know about me is that in the context of, of when I've heard God speak, I didn't hear an audible voice necessarily, but I knew it was from God because I knew what He was calling me to do was something that was within the context of his perfect will. And so for David, he recognized that as he cried out to God, that God so loved him because he was one of his covenant children that God spoke to him. Verses 5 and 6 talk to us about David being sustained by Yahweh. Look what it says. I lay down and slept. Now, I I, I don't have much trouble sleeping. I mean, I can lay my head on the pillow and, and be asleep just about as quickly as my head gets to the pillow. 
And my wife dislikes me for that. And I understand that because most people struggle on occasion with sleeping. Right? I mean, and, and if we got things on our mind, it makes it that much more difficult to sleep. Now, just think of the things that could have been on David's mind. Absalom's going to come in here and kill me. And this 12,000 man army is going to, to come and drag me away. And there's no way I can survive this. And no, that's not how David looked at this. David was so content in his belief in God and his trust in God that he was able to lay down and go to sleep. And so the lesson for us is that maybe we need to put those things away and let God lead us to rest. So the, so the word of God says, I lay down and slept, and I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. And so David recognized that, his, that the sustaining power of God brought him through those nights in those caves. And then verse 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. So you know, what, you know what David's saying? He's saying, I'm not afraid of Absalom nor his army. Because my trust, my faith, is in Almighty God. And then in verses 7 and 8, notice what it says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbones. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. So he is calling on God by saying, Arise, O Lord. He's calling on God. David is calling on God to continue to help him. Because David understands the dire nature of the situation he finds himself in. And he says, save me, O oh my God. So he is, David is asking God to continue to lead him. Even in the midst of what's going on around about him. And this idea of striking all my enemies on the cheekbone carries with it the idea of superiority. Striking someone in the face was a show of oppression of the one who had been struck. And you remember that, uh, that when Christ was uh, being tried before he was crucified, that the Word of God tells us that he was struck with an open hand on his face. And so we see this picture here of the superiority of God taking care of David, the ungodly. Remember that David was God's anointed king, right? You, you remember that story? And so he was the anointed one from God. And so when he's talking about the ungodly, he's talking about Absalom. He's talking about those who are trying to usurp that which God has ordained and put Absalom on the throne instead of God's man on the throne as well. So he was looking to God for security and for safety. The word salvation in Hebrew is literally the word deliverance. Does that make sense to you? That, that the salvation of the children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt was that God used Moses to help deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, correct? 
And so we have this idea of salvation carrying with it the picture of deliverance. And so David is imploring God to be his deliverer in the midst of this situation. And then he closes this psalm this way. Your blessing is upon your people. And so he is declaring to God that the blessings of God abide with and on the people of God. So in effect, what David is doing here in this last verse is serving as a witness to the blessing of God. Because David recognizes that he's been blessed, that God has taken care of him, that God continues to look out for him in the midst of what Absalom is doing all around about him. And that he wants, David wants, the blessing of God to abide on the people of God. And so, one of the things that that I pray about for you is that God's blessings would be manifest in your life. Because I believe God wants us to be blessed. And God wants us to be blessed with His presence. And God wants us to do those things that only God, are, are to do those things that would bring honor and glory to God, and that the only way to explain what God is doing both in us and through us is that God did it. <laughs> it was nothing that we did, but everything that God did for us in the midst of that. Fantastic song. And certainly in the the midst of these days, our trust needs to be in the hands of Almighty God. Let's pray and we'll be through. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for this glorious song. And we thank you for your word that allows us to be enlightened in numerous ways not only related to uh, Second Samuel, but the very words on the page in Psalm 3. What a blessing you are to us, Father. We see you high and lifted up. We give praise to you because you're worthy of all praise. You tell us that you inhabit the praises of your people. We honor you with our lives. And we give you glory. Because you, Father, are the only one worthy to receive glory. We thank you for all you do for us. Dismiss us now in the power of your Spirit. Bring us back together at the next appointed time. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you.